Greetings to you all and uh, welcome. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, ICAD USA, and the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. For the last decade and more, along with other Christian denominations, the United Church of Christ has been a leader in standing in solidarity with our Palestinian Christian partners, in particular, supporting the 2009 Kairos Palestine document and the 2020 Cry for Hope, a call for decisive action. Most recently, at our 2021 General Synod, the UCC Palestine Israel Network guided the denomination in adopting a landmark resolution with an overwhelming 85% of the vote, calling Israel's occupation of Palestinians both sin and an apartheid system. Today's webinar, co-sponsored with the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, is entitled The Weaponization of Antisemitism. And we're really delighted to have our guest with us, Mark Weber, a retired Dean of the Library at Kent State University, uh, a Madrid, an educator and leader within the Jewish secular community of Cleveland. Mark is also president of Cleveland Peace Action and serves on the steering committee of Jewish Voice for Peace Cleveland. Mark, uh, it's great to have you here, man, welcome. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you for having me. So Mark, let's set the stage for our conversation today by hearing a word about your personal journey. Labor activist, critic of the war in Vietnam, human rights work in Colombia, secular Jew, growing unease with Zionism that was crystallized uh, with the Israeli war on Gaza in the summer of 2000. 14, over 2,200 Palestinians killed, 550 of them children. Then your 2017 eyewitness Palestine trip to Palestine and Israel. I know there's a lot there, Mark, but can you distill for us very briefly those formative influences that have led you to where we are today? Um, sure, I'll do my best. So. I began um, uh, my journey really with thinking through how I felt about nationalism, nationalism as a force today in uh, 21st century, um, in the, the world, the 21st century. Um, Zionism, of course, is one manifestation of modern nationalism, but not the only one. Um, it is not so much that I'm anti-Zionist, I'm simply anti-nationalist, and therefore um, uh, I view uh, Zionism very critically. The uh, State of Israel's war on Gaza was certainly a formative influence, as was the uh, trip to um, the West Bank that you mentioned in 2017. During my stay there, which was not long, six Palestinian farmers unarmed were murdered. Um, two by the IDF and four by um, uh, settlers on the West Bank. And um, visiting uh, a city like Hebron, one gets the feeling that it's really um, it's a city under siege and controlled both by the mili uh, military and by um, uh, these uh, settlers armed with automatic uh, weapons. Um, my, uh, once I really began to identify with the Palestinian cause, of course, I reinforced uh, my uh, experiences with reading and really reflecting on um, what life must be like in occupied Palestine on a daily basis with checkpoints and um, uh, housing uh, demolition. Um, so 
I think that um, these are some of the factors which have been uh, sort of markers in uh, my uh, journey. So let's let's uh, take a look at the term uh, anti-Semitism, and bear with me here, Mark, as I set the stage. Just this past week, Iowa's Republican governor Kim Reynolds signed two bills into law related to Israel. One targets companies outside the United States that boycott Israel. The other adopts the controversial International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. IHRA working definition that was crafted with the help of the American Jewish Committee of Anti-Semitism. She said, today we express Iowa's enduring support for the state of Israel and our categorical rejection of anti-Semitism. Most observers say that the bill was to punish Ben and Jerry's decision to stop selling ice cream in illegal settlements. So I've got a couple of questions for you, Mark. I'd like for you to first talk about the IHRA definition adopted by the U.S. State Department in 2016 and now adopted by almost two dozen individual states. It gives 11 examples of anti-Semitism, seven of which focus on the state of Israel. Why do you, why, why do you think that the IHRA definition is so troubling? Well, I think uh, it's troubling for a couple of reasons, um, Michael. First of all, um, I'm trying to do my best to sort of conjure up the definition, but I believe it begins by saying something like... Um, I can read the definition for you here. No, that's... Um, okay. Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews, may be expressed as hatred um, toward Jews. So someone like me might ask, well, I always thought that anti-Semitism was in fact hatred toward Jews, but now the definition implies, well, yeah, that's one part of it, but there are others. And um, one of the reasons for adopting this, uh, this uh, new definition and uh, expanded definition is in part because of the rise of the Palestine Solidarity Movement and the BDS Movement, which began in 2005, when um, I believe around 150 Palestinian uh, civil society organization signed a petition or a statement. And since that time, um, almost not quite 20 years, the movement has become international. So I believe that the expansion of the definition is part of what some have called the weaponization of the charge of anti-Semitism broaden the scope so you can silence Israel's critics. You know, I really appreciate you saying that, Mark, because, you know, it's, it's the very vagueness, right? The, I mean, uh, in the definition itself, we'll get to the examples maybe in a little bit, but the, the vagueness of the definition of if it's itself is problematic. And I think that's what you're pointing to. It is, yes. Um, and um, vagueness, um, vagueness is a tool to be used, a flexible interpretation so that you can apply it, apply it to silence, um, to silence uh, critics. Yeah. And you referenced the state law passed in Iowa. Well, that's a good example. So let me, let me ask you uh, uh, another question about this. In Haaretz about a year ago, Holocaust historian Omer Bartov wrote, uh, criticism of Israel and its policies isn't anti-Semitism. And he goes on to say, by these lights, that is by this definition, the IHRA definition, 
Opposing the occupation is considered anti-Semitic. BDS is anti-Semitic. Criticism of Zionism is anti-Semitic. And the International Criminal Court in The Hague is, of course, without a shadow of a doubt, anti-Semitic. Are there? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's reinforcing what you're saying, right? And do you have other examples or do you want to comment on his quote? Well, I agree with his quote, but I wanted to mention uh, the be bewildering position that it puts students in on college campuses. For example, uh, there is a young man I know who was a student at a university, uh, uh, Indiana University, and he was uh, criticized, uh, but he was first involved in efforts to support the Rohingya people who are being victimized in um, Burma, Myanmar. And for that and his work, he received a citation uh, from the university or the student senate. The following year, um, he met a, uh, uh, a young woman and the young woman became his girlfriend and together they were involved in um, uh, BDS work. And for that, he was uh, not sanctioned, but criticized by the university because a complaint was filed by um, Hillel. So it shows you the kind of slippery slope that students are in. Some human rights work is okay. Other types of human rights work apparently are not. The battleground, it seems, is not as as the example that uh, you and I just discussed uh, uh, shows. The battleground is not only on the national level, but now it's it's filtering down to the states, as well as to college campuses. More than two dozen states have now passed anti BDS laws, using the IHRA definition as their criterion. You want to say more about the these state resolutions? Uh, well, yes, uh, just briefly, um, here in Ohio, um, we have H, uh, uh, HB 476, which was passed and penalizes uh, companies or agencies uh, from doing business with the uh, getting any direct benefit uh, from the state of Ohio if they're in some way involved in boycott uh, activity. And um, uh, there have also been other resolutions passed aimed at empowering uh, administrators to uh, punish students who criticize uh, the state of Israel uh, in public forums on um, state assisted university uh, campuses. Um, that's about all I would say um, because it's our local experience here, but this has been replicated uh, in states. I think the total number of states now is up to 31 states ah. that have uh, some kind of law and it's very disturbing. In June, 2019, seven Israeli human rights organizations including B'Tselem and Breaking the Silence, sent an open letter to the German parliament that had recently equated BD, the BDS movement with anti-Semitism. And this is what it said. Anti-Semitism is real and present. It ought to be fought and defeated wherever it occurs. But it is a disservice to the true fight against anti-Semitism to equate it with BDS, which is a nonviolent tactic and movement initiated by Palestinian civil society and supported by tens of thousands of people internationally as a part of the struggle to end the Israeli occupation and to act for equality, freedom, dignity, and justice for all Palestinians. So we, we want to, 
we want to uh, uh, fight and defeat anti-Semitism, right, wherever we find it, because it is real. And we don't have to look very far to, to, uh, to see it in our world. But it does a disservice, this letter says, to the true fight against anti-Semitism to equate BDS with it. Your thoughts? Well, I agree. Um, a law, uh, for, for quite a while, the United States and um, has criticized the Palestinian national movement uh, because there were some sections of it that resorted to violence. Um, so now um, the uh, Palestinian civil society, as you point out, has opted for an approach not that they necessarily endorsed violence, but now they're saying, no, we want to try to uh, legally and nonviolently put pressure on the government of Israel to change its policies toward occupation and suppression of Palestinian Arabs on the West Bank, and also, frankly, the kind of economic strangulation of Gaza. So when you move uh, and embrace a sort of nonviolent, uh, uh, legal nonviolent approach, you're still condemned as being an anti-Semite. So in fact, what this says is there is no way that you can effectively uh, voice opposition and try to build pressure on the Israeli government to, for example, stop the occupation. And um, uh, I think that that is um, uh, unfortunate. And it means that not just uh, the, uh, the, the Palestinian solidarity movement has both of its hands tied behind its back and there's almost nothing it can do except weak protestations um, because also they do not have the resources, of course, that Israel and its many supporters have. So uh, in what you related, I certainly support the statement made by the German uh, parliament. Yeah, that was the, uh, the yeah, that, and that, that, I just want to be clear, that was uh, the statement by these uh, Israeli human rights organizations sent to the German parliament, yeah. But my, my mistake. Yeah, yeah well, of yeah. course, uh, um, JVP and some of the other groups that, um, that wrote the letter, um, they, um, they themselves have suffered under the um, label of being anti-Semitic because they stand up for human rights. I want to follow up with another question. Uh, we don't have, as I said before, we don't have to go very far to find it alive and well, anti-Semitism, alive and well in our own country, uh, a form of racism, uh, anti-Semitism as racism, right? Uh, it seems though, Mark, like uh, crying wolf, calling the nonviolent BDS movement and other criticisms of Israel anti-Semitic, uh, dilutes calling out real anti-Semitism when you see it. So talk about this dilution of really being able to call out anti-Semitism in reality. Well, that's been a concern of uh, many of us uh, for a while. When someone, when, for example, the uh, actor Emma Watson, um, uh, I, from Harry Potter, calls out uh, or states her support for um, the uh, Palestinian people, her solidarity with the Palestinian people. She is immediately uh, accused of being an anti-Semite by the Israeli ambassador to the United States and uh, other, uh, other forces. And um, I think 
I think that um, these kind of attacks deaden us to the implications of real anti-Semitism because we're saying, well, um, is this just another accus a politically motivated accusation against critics of Israel, or is this the real thing? And the real thing doesn't have to be these uh, awful armed attacks on synagogues. They can be spoken, but simply criticizing Israel uh, for its human rights record and being called anti-Semitic for that reason is, I think, um, um, makes people wonder, well, um, what is and what isn't anti-Semitism? And especially the double standard. Um, no one would have criticized Emma Watson if she had criticized uh, Myanmar or Saudi Arabia or some other country that has um, a human rights record that is um, uh, poor. But with Israel, uh, in her case, automatically, she's an anti-Semite. And I think that's a disservice to young people, who are to anyone who's speaking out. Um, and in the end, it means that people are afraid to speak out uh, and then um, that compromises their rights, their First Amendment rights as American citizens. It might be, thanks, Mark. Uh, it, it might be instructive here uh, to know how the term anti-Semitism has expanded in definition and scope, but always connoting racial hatred for Jews. So now you, you've written about this and spoken about it. Uh, and you write about one of the first places the term was used, and I really appreciated this in your writing, by the way. Uh, one of the first places the term was used was by the German racist Friedrich Wilhelm Adolf Marr, founder of the Anti-Semitic League, heavily influenced by the eugenics movement. And you draw, uh, I mean, a pretty straight line between Marr and uh, Hitler. Talk to us about the evolution of the term anti-Semitism in the last century and a half. Um, I know uh, it's a big question, uh, but if you can distill the answer, but uh, uh, you wrote very convincingly about it, I think. Um, uh, Friedrich, uh, Friedrich Marr, who was born in 1819 and died in 1904, uh, ironically, he died in the same year as Theodor Herzl, uh, really the founder of practical Zionism. But Marr contended that uh, religious anti-Semitism uh, was unscientific. And uh, so what he wanted was a definition which focused on Jews as a race and not simply as a, um, uh, a religious group. In the past, Jews had been attacked for being um, Christ killers and then the, um, uh, the pogroms about um, uh, Christian blood being used at Passover and all of these uh, <laughs> accusations. Marr had contempt for this. He wanted a scientific definition and at the time, I know this sounds amazing, but this veneration of science as it applies to race um, was seen in some circles as being progressive and forward thinking. And it certainly uh, uh, influenced uh, Adolf Hitler. But, um, uh, and there were plenty of race theorists like um, Austin Chamberlain and uh, others. This was the beginning in 1891 when the definition was first coined by Marr. This was the real beginning of the definition, the racial definition of anti-Semitism. 
Uh, being Jewish was seen as a, a racial characteristic that was, in the words of Mar, a stain that can never be washed away. In other words, you can't escape it by converting to Christianity. And um, as several scholars have pointed out, it really is a very short walk from this to Auschwitz. And um, yeah. that really, so when some uh, uh, scholars say, well, uh, anti-Semitism has been with us for thousands of years, Jew hatred has been with us for thousands of years, not anti-Semitism. You want to make you, you want to uh, contrast those two uh, uh, just a, a bit more for us. Jew hate the, the just how you distinguish between Jew hatred and anti-Semitism. Jew hatred you you would say is more uh, all encompassing and includes the religious component, and anti-Semitism is more the 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 racist uh, issue. Is that how you would distinguish them? Did I catch that correctly? I think you did. I think that. Um... Uh, anti-Semitism is the uh, is the form of Jew hatred that is based upon race. Okay, as That's opposed helpful. to religion or uh, something else. That that's helpful. It makes me it makes me think, Mark. Uh, uh, of uh, you know, there are other options other than the IHRA definition, right? Uh, for example. In March 2021, there's the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism, signed by about 200 international scholars in Jewish Holocaust and Middle East studies, as well as legal scholars and others, written in response, right, to the IHRA definition. And I'm going to just read to you, uh, and I want to get your reaction, the 16-word definition. It's clear and straightforward. Here it is. Anti-Semitism is discrimination, prejudice, hostility, or violence against Jews as Jews or Jewish institutions as Jewish. What do you think? Um, I think that, that that's a much better definition than the IHRA definition. It's much better. However, um, people, uh, and I think it's probably in the environment, the charged environment that we live in, it's probably impossible to get a definition that's going to satisfy everyone. Yeah. However, um, when the definition that you just read talks about um, actions against Jewish institutions. Um, some people will say, well, Jewish institutions include the state of Israel. BDS is an action, and therefore it's anti-Semitic. And so that's, that's the part of the definition, that last part that's in parentheses that you'd have problems with. And Mark, you're frozen. Yeah, okay, now you're unfrozen. Good, go ahead. Yes. No, um, I'm good. Okay. Uh, this definition, by the way, the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism from 2021, lists examples about Palestine and Israel that are anti-Semitic as well as those that are not anti-Semitic. So, for example, for the latter, those that are not anti-Semitic, uh, calling any criticism of Israel, uh, uh, including BDS, anti-Semitic. It's not. Uh, 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 criticism of Zionism as a form of nationalism or Israel's systemic racism. Evidence-based criticism of Israel as a state, BDS, and a reminder that political speech is protected by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international agreements. So even the examples that it gives of things, I didn't read you the ones that are, are considered anti-Semitic, we know those, but the ones that are not considered anti-Semitic, I'm assuming you'd agree with, especially criticizing, criticizing Israel as a state or criticizing 
Zionism as a form of nationalism? Uh, yes, I would. Um, I, I can't imagine how putting, uh, how, I can't imagine how one could consider uh, anti-nationalism to be anti-Semitic. Zionism um, began in the 19th century and was in fact a form of European nationalism. Um, it originated in Europe and its, uh, its view of Palestine as a future home for Jews is, um, has a kind of colonial quality to it, which, see, which says that um, this land, even though there are other people living there, this land really belongs to us. It was promised to us and we're going to take it. And um, uh, there are other forms of nationalism that have this view. Uh, and so um, I can't imagine why uh, categorizing Zionism as a form of nationalism, which it is, would be considered uh, anti-Semitic. Um, but, um, uh, well, that's what I would say on that. Okay. Let, let, me, uh, let me return to a, a subject that we talked about earlier. Some of my friends in Jewish Voice for Peace, as well as other progressive rabbi friends and, and others, have expressed to me that this absolutist support for Israel in general, and more particular, calling any criticism of Israel, including BDS, anti-Semitic, in other words, the anti-Semitic charge, perpetuates uh, a, a Jewish victimology and really disempowers Jews as people with agency beyond their experience of the Holocaust. In other words, it, it, it identifies Jews as victims of the Holocaust and, and perpetual victims. And I'm just wondering what you think of that, and uh, especially kind of that that intra-Jewish conversation that takes place? Well, this is certainly something that um, I've uh, been concerned about for, uh, well, a number of years. And that is the idea that, um, that um, criticism of Israel and I've been told this, criticism of Israel is actually criticism of every, um, of every Jew in the United States or in the world. Because criticism of Israel um, means that you reject the right of Jews to form their own state and to be a part of the uh, family of nations. And I would have to say that this is not about a Jewish state. This is about how a particular state treats other people. And um, how the land that two peoples have shared um, now suddenly becomes the rightful uh, property of one of those people. And I don't, I, and so um, I guess I feel that um, this is a way, again, another way to demonize um, uh, criticism of Israel. And at the same time, um, denies the right and really the ability of, and I'll say American Jews, because this is where we live, American Jews to sort of make their own decision on some of the issues affecting um, uh, Israel and the Middle East. Um, we, 
as American citizens, we don't, uh, we don't give our own government that kind of blanket protection. We're always criticizing it for this thing and that thing, and we should. So um, why, would, um, uh, why would we say to American, uh, to American Jews, well, make, uh, make sure that you don't listen to anyone who criticizes Israel because they're anti-Semitic. Oftentimes, we learn from criticism. I know I do. Um, I make plenty of mistakes, and um, my wife, Felisa, points out my shortcomings, <laughs> and um, that's good. So I don't see, um, so I, I agree with the statement, and I think it's a very dangerous, um, uh, it, it's a very uh, dangerous development for American Jews to say to uh, um, somebody from the ADL or from the American Jewish Committee, uh, I won't say anything, you just speak for me. Well, Americans should speak for themselves and not allow other people to speak for us. So, Mark, in, in uh, uh, the winter 2022 issue of American Council for Judaism, you wrote that there are three additional dangers of making false accusations of anti-Semitism um, other than the ones we've just talked about. And I want you to say a word about each one, and I'll just read each one, and then you respond to it. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, you say, about these false accusations of anti-Semitism. They deflect attention away from the oppression of Palestinians by a military occupation by focusing on the motives of Israel's critics, unquote. Well, I think... Um... I think that's a very common tactic, um, and a number of people use it. Um, I, I don't want to make any comparisons, but the past master of deflecting, of course, would be um, uh, former President uh, Trump. In other words, if it's a criticism of you, some, suddenly it's really not about you. It's about your critics, their motives, and... Um, uh, so, yes, I think that um, deflecting criticism um, really, really deprives um, uh, an educated citizenry in the United States of the right for a vigorous uh, civil discourse on issues regarding how Israel treats um, some of the uh, the people over over whom they rule, not only um, uh, Israeli Arabs who are of course citizens and have the right to vote, but also um, uh, Palestinian Arabs on the West Bank who have um, they're in this limbo status. They have no um, they have really no rights. So. Um, that's a, uh, that's a common tactic, and um, uh, so far, it seems to be working. Another danger of making false accusations of anti-Semitism that you list is it, it suggests that Israel is the Jewish state, and that support for Israel is one of the core tenets of Jewish identity, unquote. Well, um, we certainly see that um, <laughs> on national, um, on TV, on uh, interviews, spokespersons for, for the Israel lobby um, say that anti-Zionism and even non-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism, even though um, Zionism itself is a relatively new phenomena to a religion and a peoplehood which is thousands of years old. So I think um, I think that um, this uh, attempt again 
to criticize the critics rather than engage in a responsible debate on the issues um, is very harmful. You know, it reminds me, I'll get to the third one in just a second, but it reminds me of how in, in the relig Christian religious right, the Christian right in America, how they conflate, right, uh, the gospel with, with American exceptionalism. And it's, it's, it strikes me that that's very similar to the conflation of Judaism with Zionism. That's right. That's very true. And um, uh, the reform movement, there is one of, one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons of um, why in the reform movement, uh, synagogues are called temples is because the reform movement at this time, we're talking now in the uh, uh, mid 19th century, felt that American Judaism, uh, that our home was, um, was America, I should say the United States. And um, this is our home, this is our promised land, not a uh, territory in the Middle East. And this was commonly accepted, uh, uh, not doctrine, but commonly accepted point of view, really, until the 1930s, when uh, at the uh, Central Conference of American Rabbis Convention in Columbus, Ohio, in 1937, a rabbi named Abba Hillel Silver was able to inject the idea of nationhood and um, and then and Zionism into what into the basic principles of the reform movement, mm -hmm. and so um, for a long time um, there was no Zionism, and I don't believe that you can equate Jewish fondness for the Middle East as uh, is where our origins were to the political movement that demanded a, a state in the Middle East, which would involve Jews um, uh, ruling over other people. So certainly, and the you mentioned the American Council for Judaism, um, many of the founders of that organization were reform rabbis who came out of the tradition that I just mentioned. The third additional danger of making a false accusation of anti-Semitism that you list is such identification of Judaism with Israel that perpetuates human rights violations actually increases the likelihood of anti-Semitic violence around the world. Say a word about that. Well, um, when former... Uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke in several uh, countries in Europe, Denmark, um, and I don't remember the other two. He spoke about Israel as being the nation state for Jews. And he said that world Jewry has a duty to be to uh, come to Israel and help build the uh, nation state of Jews, Israel. He also spoke disparagingly of Jews who live in the diaspora and who and who enjoy living in the diaspora and several. Uh, several uh, Jewish communities um, gave him some pushback and said that um, they were happy living where they were. Thank you very much. What happens is that if Israel is closely identified as being at the core of Judaism, uh, and if all Jews 
are seen as sort of Zionists, then um, people who are angry with Israel will target Jews because of this close association. Yeah. yeah. Targeting um, Jewish institutions for violence is wrong. Targeting individual Jews is wrong. But this sort of a connection exists. And um, I think that um, people like the former prime minister should rethink how they characterize um, uh, the, the relationship between Jews and Israel. Thank you, Mark. I, I want to get personal now, if you don't mind. You, you shared um, that, uh, that you can speak as one who, be, because of your personal and moral journey, had been attacked and lost personal friends. Um, you know, for those of us who are not Jews, the charge uh, for criticism of Israel, support of BDS, etc., is that we're anti-Semitic. More often than not, the charge for Jews, right, is that you're a self-hating Jew. Um, just talk to us. Most of us here on the call, not all maybe, but most of us are not Jews. Talk to us about that charge and just your own journey with regard to that charge. Well, um... I mean, that's got to be tough. I mean, that's got to be a real tough one, right? It is. Um, so on a, several different levels. One is if you want to, um, I'm a secular Jew, but if I wanted to um, affiliate with a synagogue where I live, all of the synagogues and uh, are Zionist. And the leadership, and especially the rabbis, are afraid to be otherwise. I think one rabbi said to me, you know, he said, I, I agree with you, but I can't say it because I'll lose my job. What it means, uh, so there's that angle. That's also, of course, the loss of friends. Um, and... Um, the uh, and it also comes down to intimidation. I mean, I've spoken in uh, at Case Western Reserve last November on this very topic, and in um, February at Cleveland State on this topic. And in each case, I received uh, threatening um, phone calls um, from people. They wouldn't give their names, but they identified themselves as being um, supporters of Israel. And um, they attacked me, not really as self-hating Jews, but simply as an anti-Semite. Yeah. So, um, uh, and this kind of thing um, continues because I'm scheduled to speak again, and I fully expect more uh, phone calls. And it does, it bothers me, but it's not going to stop me from doing what I feel is right. But I think you find this um, uh, in many, um, many people have faced this. Um, and uh, I think that um, when I think of what I have suffered, I think I haven't really suffered at all. If you want to see people who have suffered, go to Palestine and, and look at them. They are the people who have suffered. They are the ones who have seen the, uh, the real face of Zionism on a daily basis. And we could talk about um, housing demolitions and um, uh, harassment. Uh, and um, we could... There, in many different ways. Um, I saw a, 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 in a picture of Jewish settlers throwing rocks at Palestinian farmers 
and the Jewish settlers throwing the, um, the rocks were protected by the IDF. With, and the IDF, of course, was armed, IDF being Israel Defense Force. So I think, um, I really would say that um, it's, a, it's a price I'm willing to pay. And compared with the way other people have suffered, um, I don't think that I've paid as much of a price, certainly, as, uh, as they have. And, um, uh, but to say that it's, it is painful when someone says to me, you know, uh, I can't be your friend anymore. Yeah. I, I want you to <clears throat> say a word. Uh, what, what do you make of uh, Christian Zionism that purports to love Israel but hates Jews? Uh, you know, individually, uh, you know, the Jews only as a pretext to the salvation of a certain number of elect Christians. What do you make of uh, Christian Zionism a as an as anti-Semitic in the end? You know, uh, it's interesting, right? Christian Zionism loves Israel, but it's anti-Semitic in its, in its damning of Jews at the end of history. Please uh, comment if you would. Well, it's, um, um, it is in some ways, um, I once called it the original anti-Semitism because it is um, an effort. I mean, you talk about taking agency away from Jews. Yeah, boy. Jews are seen as simply the vehicle through which the second <laughs> coming occurs. And um, uh, uh, John Hagee of Christians United for Israel, Kufi, for example, one, and um, uh, Reverend Jeffries, uh, and I've forgotten his organization, but um, they have said things like, well, God does not hear the prayers of Jews, yeah. um, and that Jews have a stain on them. Sounds like um, uh, our friend Friedrich Marr. Jews have a stain on them that cannot be erased. So I think that um, this uh, this um, uh, position by Christian Zionists. And the fact that Israel, I wouldn't, I don't know how they they feel, but they promote um, a, a relationship with Christian Zionists, and they were, uh, they're also um, the, uh, they're, they pitch many of their policies and comments not toward American Jews, whom. Uh, uh, at least uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he was in office, said American Jews are really too liberal. And the biggest supporters of Israel, he said, would, would be the Christian right. The, Absolutely. Uh, so, um, uh, well, anyway, I think that it's, um, uh, in the end, it's simply, um, it's anti-Semitic because they are uh, denying any agency to Jews. Jews are simply part of, divine, of a divine plan. And um, at the end, there'll be no need for them. You know, uh, um, we tend to forget, do we not, that Christian Zionism preceded Jewish Zionism, you know, uh, and, and it originated in the UK. So Mark, I... I Bear with me here as I mention just a few resources. The United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network has published a very helpful guide entitled Difficult Conversations by Reverend Elise Higginbotham. I think Elise is on the call today, so Elise, thank you for that, uh, which I'd really recommend to our listeners. It's been informed by both our Palestinian Christian and Jewish Voice, for, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace partners. 
We also know Mark Ellis's ecumenical interfaith deal and Mark Braverman's fatal embrace, both warnings to Christians about losing their soul uh, in their desire for Jewish dialogue partners. What's your warning as well as your advice for Christian pastors and their parishioners in how to engage in meaningful civil discourse with their Jewish friends, many of whom they're partnering with in other areas of social justice in their community? But on, on this particular issue, right, they completely disagree. So they may be partners in various hunger efforts or immigration efforts or LBG, LGBTQ efforts in their communities, but on Palestine, they disagree. What, what's your advice to Christian pastors and uh, uh, parishioners about how to engage in meaningful dialogue with their Jewish uh, partners and friends? I think um, so. If we're talking about some reform and conservative or reconstructionist congregations, I think the discussion when you when you um, when it involves um, uh, the Orthodox community is pretty difficult. But for the more of the liberal uh, denominations, um, if because I've had this experience, you mean Jewish denominations, right? Uh, uh, yeah, liberal, yeah, yeah. Jew, uh, reform and conservative and reconstructionist. When yeah, you, yeah. Um, when a rabbi says to me or says to a minister, well, look, um, you really have to. I need your support on um, uh, on Israel. It's under attack, and I need you to stand with me and to criticize the uh, critics, to attack, not attack, but to characterize the critics as being um, uh, either anti-Semitic or, um, if not anti-Semitic, um, misinformed. And um, I think that the um, Christian pastor or really has to say to the rabbi, you know, rabbi, we agree on many things. Um, fighting hunger in our community, um, addressing the issue of police violence, and um, uh, fighting evictions these sorts of things, but we can't agree, we, we don't, that doesn't necessarily mean that we agree on everything. And um, um, I'd like to be able to say that I can support you 100% on what you think uh, is support for Israel, but I can't. But what I can offer you is a chance to sit down and talk about it, where I can learn your concerns, um, and not the type of concerns we hear through a bullhorn, but really person to person sitting down and saying, um, uh, what are your greatest fears? And uh, what are your concerns? And how do you personally feel about what is going on uh, on the West Bank. And uh, you can, uh, the Christian pastor can then say, and I'll tell you how I feel. And it's my faith that brings me to this point. And I think, um, I think that there is a lot of room for that kind of uh, dialogue. It has to begin by stressing uh, areas of common agreement, um, even if it's uh, issues not related to Israel. But I think um, uh, for some, but I think that our support for Israel should not be seen as a given. Um, what has to be said 
is that, uh, let's say, as um, uh, UCC clergy or uh, active uh, lay people, their religious or your religious principles that you live by are what guide you to take a particular uh, uh, view uh, of Israel and of the Palestinians. And maybe the rabbi and the Christian clergy can sort of walk together and discuss this. But I don't think that um, this sort of tit for tat, look, I'll support you if you support me. Um, you know, that sort of horse trading goes on in Congress all the time. But this is really, we're talking about moral journeys and, um, uh, and this is something different. I want, you to, I want you to continue to talk about the way forward, Mark. Uh, you say uh, in your article that an important solution is, quote, <clears throat> to break the false connection between Israel and Jewish identity. Israel is a settler colonial enterprise that has no relationship to the important ethical teachings of Judaism. And you talked about earlier in the article, the ethical teachings of Judaism are particularly, not exclusively, but particularly based in the prophets. So say, say a word about breaking this connection between Israel and Jewish identity and the important ethical teachings of Judaism. I think um, as a way forward, you know, uh, uh, to, to break the impasse. I think it's a way for um, Jews who are critical of Israel and Jews like me who are not Zionists to say to um, Jews who are Zionist, um, look, I draw my, the lessons that I try to apply from our sacred writings. Um, from the uh, from the prophets or from the writings, and because frequently um, they um, talk about Leviticus, and this as being a kind of Jewish national story, and with all respect to the the, the Torah and the Tanakh, which includes all of the writings and the prophets, religious books are not history. And um, I think that um, what we want to try to encourage is Jews saying, look, I understand, I understand that um, that you feel that Zionism is a part of your core beliefs as a Jew. I don't. And um, the prophetic writings are where I get my inspiration. And um, I certainly will respect, whether or not I agree with them, I will respect where you see your beliefs coming from, but you have to do the same to me. And don't call me a self-hating Jew. Well, I'm aware of the time, folks. Um, I, I want to give Mark the last word. But before I do, I just want to remind you all that our webinar today is being presented by the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network and the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Uh, shortly after the webinar today, we'll be translating the Zoom recording into a YouTube video, and we'll be posting it on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel, and the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network will be making it available as well. Mark, it's been great to have you. Do you have any parting words for us? Well, I think... Um... I think one of the things that um, I want to talk a little bit about is, um, is the idea of privilege. Um, 
you know, much has been written about white privilege uh, with regard to Americans, uh, uh, with regard to the United States and our own um, uh, past with slavery and with settler uh, colonialism, because um, uh, we are, in fact, a settler colonial nation. And I think that what we need to say, we need to realize is that this is not about a bunch of uh, the Palestine solidarity movement is not about uh, people living in comfort in the United States, criticizing um, Israel without having any idea about what it's like to live in Israel. Um, I visited Israel, I don't live there, but I see the most important element here is that what I really want and what we want is agency for the Palestinian people to decide things for themselves and not to have their history being characterized by their oppressors. When people say, when people say that um, Israel is democratic, they are right. It is democratic for Israeli Jews and to a much lesser extent for Israeli Arabs. But for Palestinians, they have no voice. What we want to do is to allow them to have a voice. For a long time, we have had the tyranny of a single story. We have had the tyranny of the sort of Zionist heroic story about how Israel came to be and made the land bloom. And um, all of that is good. But um, there were other people living there and they have been pushed out of the way and marginalized and in some cases killed. Their national identity has been erased. And at least in the words of a, um, in the words of a um, Jewish scholar, Raphael Lemkin, 1945, he wrote a book on genocide and coined the term right after the Holocaust. And he said that genocide is not necessarily about killing people, although certainly that's a big part of it, but it's also about erasing people's identity of themselves, their culture, their religion, their institutions. And that's what we see going on in, um, uh, in the West Bank and, uh, and in Gaza. And so um, what I simply want to do is to give us a chance to hear also the Palestinian narrative as well as the kind of Zionist heroic uh, narrative. And if offering the other side a chance to speak is anti-Semitism, then I think that shows how, um, how impoverished the public discourse on Israel and Palestine has become in the United States. And um, Michael uh, and Ali and everyone who is listening, uh, I suspect some, perhaps many have disagreed with me and I honor that disagreement, but I think that um, uh, whether we're Jews or Christians or Muslims or atheists or whatever, uh, we cannot allow this injustice to continue. Thank you. Mark Weber, 
thank you very much for your insights and solidarity in the cause for Palestinian justice and human rights. And thank all of you uh, for joining us today.